Whenever I see a game marked with procedural generation on Steam, I get shivers running down my spine. On one hand, I could end up buying an infinitely replayable dungeon exploring masterpiece, while on the other hand, I could end up buying this. And it's because there's one huge issue with procedural generation. You just can't be 100% sure what will it produce. Even games that seem like they've mastered it can produce something like this. Yikes. And on top of that, there's a high probability the game won't have a soul since it's made by an algorithm without an artistic touch and vision. So do we just create everything manually? Well, what if I told you that one guy managed to solve both of these issues? He figured out a way to create an infinite number of environments while ensuring that every corner was still being manually created by hand. And on top of that, he went one step further and placed creative control in the hands of players. The name behind the brilliance is Oscar Stahlberg, and if it doesn't ring a bell, you've probably heard of one of his games, Townscaper or Bad North. These games are completely driven by simple player inputs, but keep producing breathtaking visuals without unexpected results. So how did he do it? To get an answer to this question, we have to go back all the way to 2015. And while I was busy trying to change the world by implementing stuff like this, Oscar started his exploration of combining procedural generation and handmade 3D models. To truly experience his journey, I'm going to recreate each step by constructing a small procedural island generator. The first thing he did was set up a constraint. The procedural generation algorithm will work on a grid. To implement one, all we have to do is to distribute points at specific distance from each other and connect them with lines. Now we can place a piece on the grid by casting a ray from the camera and checking where it intersects it. Voila! Ok, so we got the basic placement system working. Let's now add a bit of details to each piece to make it look a bit more interesting. However, this is where Oscar ran into the first issue. The pieces don't fit seamlessly anymore. To solve this issue, what we can do is to create a different 3D model of the current piece based on the number of land pieces that surround it. Then we just swap the 3D model of the current piece with the one that matches the current neighbor's configuration. Well, while this method works, the number of 3D models we would need to create skyrockets. Even for this simple case where we only support land or water tiles, for each piece there's 256 different configurations of neighbors. Of course, we can take into account that some configurations are just rotated or mirrored versions of other configurations, but that still leaves us with 15 distinct cases. However, immediately after I started modeling, I stumbled upon another challenge. How should I handle connections between pieces in order to get nice rounded corners? I have two options. The first one is to inset a piece a bit inside the tile. This will enable me to create these nice rounded convex corners. The consequence though is that the concave corners are now sharp and narrow. Hmm, <laughs> this is not ideal. The other solution is to enlarge the piece a bit so that it goes outside the tile. This way the concave corners can be nice and round. Awesome. Hold your enthusiasm though because the convex corners look like shit now. So what can we do to solve this issue? If you're thinking that we should create a dual grid, you're wrong. What we need to do is to create a dual grid. No, 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 no. A dual grid is basically a copy of the main grid that is offset by half of the cell size. So each point on the main grid is located at the center of the corresponding cell in the dual grid. If we now create pieces on this dual grid instead of the main one, we can get both convex and concave corners nice and round since we're modeling them inside each tile and not on its corner. For example, let's say that this tile on the main grid is a land tile. To construct it using the dual grid, we need to update the 3D models of these four tiles of the dual grid. Now, you may be thinking that we added some extra work here, since we need to update four tiles instead of only one on the main grid. But in reality, this doesn't matter. It only matters how many distinct 3D models we need to create. And with this dual grid approach, we actually reduce the number of required variations from 15 
all the way down to 6. You see, on the main grid, the type is defined for the whole tile, so the whole tile represents land or water. But on the dual grid, the type is defined for each corner of the tile, so each corner of the tile can either be land or water. This gives us 16 unique combinations, but since some of them are just rotated or mirrored versions of other variations, we end up with 6 distinct tiles. A massive reduction. To make tile placement work with the dual grid, we need to do a bit of refactoring. First, instead of finding the closest quad on the main grid from the mouse position, we need to find the closest point on the dual grid. On click, we can change the type of the point from water to land, and then find the four quads that are connected to it. Finally, for each of these quads, we need to update the 3D model that visualizes them. And this is how our placement system looks now. Both convex and concave corners are nice and round, and the pieces seamlessly connect to each other. Awesome. But if you look at our final creation, it looks pretty bad. I did rush these models a bit, so let's model a bit nicer pieces with more detail and personality. Having in mind that my artistic skills are basically non-existent, I think they ended up quite decent. And let's see them in action. Well, this is a bit better, but we can still clearly see repetitions everywhere. In order to hide them, Oscar decided to create multiple variants of each piece and then randomly select one of them during the placement. After spending a couple of hours in Blender, I managed to spit out these incredible variations. If you need a 3D modeler, hit me up. I'm just saying. Let's see where we are now. Okay, this is starting to shape up a bit finally. However, we can still clearly see that everything is created on a grid. How could we make it look more organic? Well, what if we would shake up the grid a bit so that it doesn't look so regular anymore? We could do that, but now our pieces don't fit perfectly anymore. To fix this, we need to squash and stretch them a bit. Luckily, there's a pretty straightforward and common solution for this. First, we define a set of points on the bounds of the model. These points will serve as handles for deformation. Next, we transform the position of every vertex of the model into a percentage of the total width, height and depth of the bounds. Using these percentages, we can recreate the deformed position of each vertex once the handles are displaced. Pretty cool, right? And with that, we can now shake up the grid a bit and the pieces should still connect perfectly. It already looks much more natural and organic, even with this simple randomization applied to the grid. Imagine what it would look like if we applied a better algorithm. And this is where Oscar truly showed his brilliance. He invented an algorithm that creates an organic looking main grid whose dual grid is completely made up of quads. He started by placing some points in the shape of a hexagon. Then he added another layer of points around them with an additional point between each outer point. We can continue doing this based on the desired size of the grid. Next, we need to connect these points into triangles, starting from the center point. Here's where the funky stuff happens. We now need to randomly dissolve some edges so that two triangles become a quad. We can do that an arbitrary amount of times or until there are no more triangles to dissolve. But we're not done yet. There are still some triangles left and we need to make sure that the grid is only made up of quads. So let's divide each remaining triangle into three quads. Ugh, did we just make it worse? To fix this mess, we just need to divide each quad into four smaller quads. Okay, this looks much better, but it still looks regular and stiff. Well, that's why we need to implement a quick relaxation algorithm to make it relax a bit. What a relaxation algorithm does is it simply tries to place each point so that it's equally distant to every point it connects to. After a couple of iterations, we get this nicely relaxed grid. And if you're thinking to yourself, wow, this man is a genius. Wait until you hear this. Since this patch is in the shape of a hexagon, we can easily create more patches and just connect them to this one, thus creating an infinite, irregular, quadrilateral grid. But I just call it the Stalberg's grid. If we now apply this grid to our little island placement system, 
we get something like this. Damn, this looks so much more organic and natural, and a bit funky as well, which is always a plus in my book. Now, I would be pretty satisfied with this, but not Oscar. He went a step further. To break the repetition even more, what we can do is to create pieces that span across multiple tiles. Since we know what the underlying tile types are for those pieces, we can be more creative and add a bit more artistic expression to them. To place them, here's what we need to do. Before placing a new tile, we need to check the neighboring tiles and see if they match the pattern of any of our special pieces. For each neighboring tile that is a match, we expand this search to its neighbors until we either fully match the pattern of a special piece or exhaust all options. While placing tiles, the moment a match is triggered feels truly magical and satisfying. It's no wonder that this mechanic resulted in a very successful game called Townscaper. Now, while this system is already procedurally generating the island, it's guided by the player input, which for some use cases is not needed. For example, in Bad North, players don't create the islands manually. Instead, they're created automatically through code. The algorithm that generates them actually has two names. The first guy who invented it, Paul Morel, named it Model Synthesis in 2007. But it didn't really got popularized until 2016, when Maxim Gumin popularized a related method called Wave Function Collapse. However, this Wave Function Collapse algorithm is so interesting that it deserves a video of its own. And if that's something that interests you, make sure to leave a like to let me know. Hopefully with this video I managed to interest you a bit in procedural generation and show you one way of how it can be implemented to produce controlled outputs while still having the ability to maintain that artistic expression by manually creating each piece. Thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next one.